Now, as I uh, am preparing to read the scripture, I want, I, I pretty, I'm pretty sure that many of you out there are following along in your Bibles. And when I get through with these eight verses, I want you to keep your Bible nearby because I'm going to ask you to, to uh, refer back to them in just a little while. So, our scripture passage for Easter, we, we followed Mark all this way. We've journeyed with Jesus through Mark, and now we have Mark's gospel lesson on the resurrection. That's chapter 16 in Mark, verses 1 through 8. Here begins the reading. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the written word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. I dare say that all of us have seen or heard some of the kindness and compassion and generosity that some have demonstrated during the pandemic. Doctors, nurses, and other health care professionals working straight through days at a time. Some sleeping in their car so as not to infect their families at home. Musicians offering concerts from their homes Celebrities paying for people's groceries at the supermarkets. Many of you making face masks for whoever needs them. And our own coach, Ramish, who fashioned some face shields and produced them with Deleon High School's 3D printer for Comanche County Hospital. These are amazing acts in the midst of terror. We keep hoping that the morning news will tell us that there have been fewer cases, fewer deaths than the day before. A hopeful sign that this might be starting to level off. We think that we would like things to go back like they were. When we could depend on things being where they should be. Toilet paper. <laughs> and people acting as they should. We are learning that this world is not always like that. God's will is certainly not like that. Mary, Mary, Salome were not expecting a miracle when they came to the tomb. They were expecting to find the body of their dear friend and teacher, Jesus. They expected the heavy stone to be in place over the opening of the tomb. But when they got there, it had already been rolled away. Here is where they probably started to get scared. Why was it rolled away? Had someone stolen Jesus' body? Maybe the robbers were still inside. Still, they went on in and were met by another surprise. No body was laying where Jesus should have been. Instead, a young man dressed in a white robe 
was sitting on one end of that space. Now, we don't really know who the young humanoid was, but throughout the writings of the Bible, if someone is dressed in white, you can bet that there is a heavenly element involved somewhere. That's why we think of this man as an angel. And angel or not, the women were afraid of him, which usually happens with angels. We can think of some times when an angel has confronted a human, and the first thing that the angel says is, do not be afraid, or as in our story, do not be alarmed. It doesn't seem like it did much good for the angel to say that. For after he gave the women the instructions of what to do when they left, when the two Marys and Salome did leave, they were overcome with terror and amazement. So much so that when they left, they said nothing to no one, for they were afraid. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of Mark's gospel, according to Mark. Now, some of your Bibles, and go ahead and get your Bibles back in your laps there up on the recliners. <laughs> some of your Bibles may have a break after this verse 8, and then verses 9 through 20. I have a copy of the King James Version that never misses a beat. It just continues on like there was never a question that there were 20 verses. But the truth is, there was and is a question. Some of your Bibles may have a break after verse 8, then a shorter ending, and then a break, and then the longer ending, which is verses 9 through 20, along with some explanations in the footnotes. If your Bible includes the shorter ending, just take a look at it and read it along with me. Here we go. And all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Now I ask you, does that sound like the mark that we have come to know and love? No! Nothing like him. Maybe his seminary professor. The thinking is that someone else wrote that ending. And even another person wrote the longer one. Why? Why wasn't the ending that Mark supplied good enough? I want you to throw out a few answers among yourselves at home. The, there's a good chance that they're all probably correct. The reason that I think the scribes and scholars throughout the centuries were not satisfied with Mark's ending is because it does not do justice to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God's plan is not carried out. Jesus does not appear to the disciples, and the worldview was shattered. This is Easter. This is Resurrection Sunday. We want to see Jesus in his glory. We want hope for the world. We want nothing to be the same after this day. We've been through Good Friday. We've earned this. We want a happy ending. And especially in these times, we need a happy ending. So why on earth would Mark end his gospel in this way? One way that I think of this is that perhaps Mark is protecting all of the players in this scene. If he writes that the women actually met up with the disciples and then they all met Jesus in Galilee, maybe the Jewish religious officials would catch them and arrest them, or worse. It has been noted that Mark was the first gospel written. And so maybe as time went on, 
the writers felt more secure about opening it up and going ahead and finishing that, that more verses. John even writes in his gospel that the disciples were hiding in fear of the Jews. Anyway, this is one of my thoughts on it. The thing is, Jesus was raised from the dead, and the women were given instructions. But as they were leaving, still totally stunned by what they had experienced, they decided not to tell anyone anything. Maybe Mark is counting on us to connect the dots, to ease us closer to amazement and away from terror. This is certainly not a bad idea. If you have ever read a book or maybe watched a movie about people who were or are being oppressed by the government or others in power or privilege, you may have come across a certain cycle in the lives of those who were Christian. Oppressed people stay close to the cross of Jesus. They can easily identify with what he went through before and during his crucifixion. And they worship this Jesus. They cannot, however, identify with the glory of Jesus at his resurrection and ascension. There is nothing in their lives that can relate them to that kind of feeling. It has been suggested that the rest of us believers in Christ maintain a balance between these two. In other words, when we spend too much time on the glory of Christ, we should bring ourselves back to the cross of Jesus, his death, and crucifixion. Then if we linger there too long, it is time to consider the empty tomb, Jesus' triumph over death, along with eternal life exemplified and offered to us. I hope that as you think of this, that you come to the conclusion, and I feel this in all that I know that I'm talking to, that you already keep a pretty good balance between these two aspects of Jesus. I find myself, depending on what is going on in my life, thinking more about God's sacrifice of Jesus and that of Jesus for us and it works well for that season of my life. Other times I stand amazed in the presence and glory of Jesus and his resurrection and ascension. When I am in either of these seasons of my life, I wonder what brought me there. Why now am I with Jesus at the cross and now at the empty tomb? And it comes to me in a still, small voice that packs a punch. It's love. You know, it's one thing to think of God's giving His Son to us to teach and heal, and quite another to remember how Jesus gave Himself so completely for all the world. It's one thing for Jesus to show us the already of eternal life, the closeness of the kingdom of God, and another thing for him to promise and arrange it so that we will never be alone or orphaned, and the Holy Spirit will be our guide until the day when he comes again and all creation is reconciled with God. And all of those things are love. The love of God who gave of himself and the love of him who was given, Jesus. He taught us to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And for each of us to love one another as he, Jesus, loves us. In the name of the Father.